Hey everyone, Michael Thiessen here, and today I am joined by Bob Murphy to talk about the intersection of economics and climate science. Uh, we just released a video this week on our new uh, 2030 emissions reduction plan and how dangerous it is for Canadians. Today I have the privilege to talk to Dr. Robert Murphy. Uh, Bob has his PhD in economics and he's a fellow at the Mises Institute and he's a host of the Bob Murphy Show. Bob, thanks for coming on. Thanks for having me. Glad to be here. Did I pronounce that correct? Mises Institute? It, Mises. Mises. Okay, that's great. What, what, what institute is that that, uh, that you can make our listeners aware of? Sure. So they're they're based in Auburn, Alabama. It's named after the economist Ludwig von Mises. Um, so he was a member of what's called the Austrian School of Economics that, you know, it's a school like there's the Chicago School, the Keynesian yep. School. So the Austrians named, of course, uh, because their founders were originally from Austria. Um, and they it, it's they tend to be very free market, but it is, you know, they do have a particular methodological principles that they use to try to explain economic outcomes in terms of individual action. Um, they, they sort of eschew mathematical models that they don't think accurately capture, you know, the, the complexities of human action. Um, I guess what distinguishes the Austrians from other free market schools like the Chicago school is the Austrians have a theory of the business cycle that says it's caused by the banking system inflating the economy with artificial credit that pushes interest rates down and that causes the boom bust cycle. And so just to give one example, so the Chicago school tends to blame recessions on tight money, whereas the Austrians say, oh, no, recessions happen because of the boom period, which was due to loose money, you know, earlier. So that that's kind of how the Austrians fit. And they tend to be very free market in their policy recommendations. But but again, they do have a sp specific theory of the business cycle that sets them apart. Well, thanks for sharing about that. The The topic of the, the day right now uh, that I want to ask you about is what we're seeing globally and then specifically here in Canada under our liberal government, we are seeing a, a real push for a green agenda, a climate change agenda to change the economics of our country. So specifically, we see, you know, in, you know, the COVID-19, the Great Reset, we see the WEF literally saying that individuals should change their behaviors and that we should have structural national structural changes in order to battle climate change because everything is intertwined and uh what are you seeing uh, across the the spectrum with this force to move to a to a green agenda so quickly um and how that is connected to or what do you how is that going to affect our, our economics well, sure. It's a great question. So let me start with the sort of more um, easily demonstrated claims, you know, for some of your listeners who, who might you know, not be familiar with this literature. So what the, I think the, the biggest takeaway I want to get across is the policies that the more extreme activists are pushing and that, for example, in, in Canada, what the government policymakers are adopting, they do not follow from the you know, mainstream peer reviewed science. And, and so uh, it, the, it, for decades in this climate change debate, you know, the activists have been just using the, hey, follow the science, uh, the calling their opponents deniers, sort of evoking, you know, images of Holocaust denial to say, if, if, if you oppose these policy measures, it's because you just are ignorant of the science or you're just, you know, some dupe of big oil or something. And so what I want to stress is the, the actual measures being put forward do not at all follow from the conventional mainstream published literature, just to give some examples. So right now, the federal carbon tax in Canada is set to increase to, I think it's $170 a ton by the year 2030. That is way out of line with the standard projections about what the so-called social cost of carbon will be by 2030. Okay, so again, if uh, stipulating the, the whole premise of mankind's emissions of carbon dioxide constitute a negative externality and that's causing damages and so therefore government has a role in in sort of putting an extra disincentive in place to get all the you know the pros and cons lined up so businesses naturally do the socially optimal thing that's the standard sort of chalkboard economics approach to this stuff and i'm saying the estimates they have are like for 60 or 70 dollars a ton of what the the damage is going to be and so to, to be taxing it at 170 a ton doesn't follow even on its own terms, right? Even if you stipulate the basic framework. So the, the, that number is not coming from the science. 
besides which Canada is just a bit player in the whole overall scheme. So it really makes no sense for Canada to be having these draconian uh, penalties on carbon dioxide emissions and other greenhouse gas emissions. If the rest of the world isn't following suit, because all, what that just means is emissions will migrate out of Canada and go to say China or somewhere else. So it's not even doing that much for global emissions. All it's doing is punishing Canadian businesses to give another quick example of this huge chasm between what the official policies that, that are being promulgated and, and, and pushed versus what the literature says. William Nordhaus won the Nobel prize recently um, in economics for his work on climate change and his Nobel prize winning model suggests allowing total global warming of about 3.5 degrees Celsius. And yet, as I'm sure you're aware and your listeners who follow this stuff, the UN and the other activist groups in the, the Paris climate accords and agreement and so forth are saying, Oh, is it absolute most we can allow is two degrees Celsius and let's try to limit warming to 1.5 degrees. And so it's not merely that Nordhaus is more liberal than that. Nordhaus's own work shows even the two degrees Celsius limit would be so draconian, would hurt business and households so much by making energy more expensive that it would be worse for humanity to do that rather than do nothing at all about climate change. Right. So that, that, that again, so it's not just like, oh, he disagrees by a few percentage points. He's saying that goal is worse than doing nothing. And, and again, he, he's not some right winger. This is a guy who published with Paul Samuelson and, and so forth. I mean, this he, he's a liberal guy. He won the Nobel Prize for his work trying to alert humanity to the dangers of carbon dioxide emissions. And yet his own work is saying so. My, my point being, it's not just a matter of is this a problem or not? I'm saying the solutions that are being pushed by the U.N. and by you know the Canadian government, and other governments around the world don't follow at all from the mainstream Nobel Prize winning literature. So you it makes you realize something is screwy is going on here. This really isn't just about well-meaning people who are trying to save our grandkids. So Bob, I like to do what I call on this show, investigative listening. And many of our listeners are becoming aware of how this, this climate debate is really pushing economic policies. Like really, you just said that some of the policies out there are, would be more detrimental to humanity than if we did nothing. So maybe take a step back and, and tell us, you know, what sparked your interest in the climate change policy debate? And then maybe even a, another question to follow up with that after that would be, is climate change truly an emergency that it's being made out by our government? So I think, I think in our first segment there, you, you, tr you started answering that second question about, um, it, it may not even be following the science, but th let's, let's go all the way back. So what got you sparked, uh, what sparked your interest in talking about this issue? Sure. So I guess I really got into this, um, I'm trying to think of the timeline here. I think it was in 2007 ish, uh, when I started working for what's called the Institute for Energy Research. So that was a U.S. think tank specializing on energy issues and its founder, Rob Bradley, um, you know, he actually studied under Murray Rothbard, who was an Austrian economist. And so Rob was very attuned to, um, the benefits of free markets and how, you know, humans can solve problems voluntarily through the market process rather than top down government intervention. But he, he had a particular interest in energy issues. And so it was Rob who told me, Hey, you need to go get these IPCC reports. That's the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the UN's body that was set up to periodically distill the latest research on climate change. Um, he said, you know, you, you need to become an expert on this stuff because he and he was saying going forward, this is going to be a huge topic. And, and turned out Rob was very prescient in saying that that. Um, and, and so, yeah, I, I just dove into the literature. And, and this is what I discovered, Michael, that I went in thinking because I had been influenced by the, you know, the debate and hearing both sides and what their postures were that I had gone in thinking that, oh, yeah, the U.N. was going to have all of the reputable scientists on one side and then the people who are opposing this stuff were going to be relying on, you know, some crank guy out in some podunk university somewhere or some alternate data set or something like that at the heritage. Fund. And that, as I told you, that's not what ended up happening. It was just when you go and read even, even the UN's own published literature reviews, it says everything you need to know in terms of challenging the real extreme recommendations or policy proposals 
because they, because they don't follow one doesn't follow from the other. So it, most of what I have been doing over the years in this, in this area is just going and reading the actual research, the peer reviewed stuff, the, the UN's own, you know, ex, chosen experts and just saying, Hey, look at the actual research. It does not support what is being promulgated in the name of this report. And it, it's really like, it's sort of like a three pronged thing where the, the underlying research is very tentative and, you know, saying, you know, here's what we can say. Here's what we can't say. Very moderate conclusions. Then the executive summary for policymakers is more alarmist and kind of leaves out the nuance. And then the media reporting on what the UN said is even more extreme, right? And so by the time it reaches the average person, it's gone through a few filters and all that's left is we have to do such and such immediately or we're all dead. And again, again, the underlying literature doesn't support that stuff at all. So, so to answer, you know, to circle back, you had asked about, you know, is, is this a crisis or so, I mean, it, it is an issue and it's worth studying. And, and so I'm not here saying, oh, all the scientists agree that there's no, there's no problem here. That that's not the case, but there's two things going on. So one is a, a, a natural scientist, somebody who, you know, studies emissions and understands atmospheric dynamics and whatnot. That does not qualify the person to say this is how much of a tax the government should levy on carbon dioxide emissions, right? Because that involves a whole realm of economics and understanding the interplay between natural changes to the atmosphere and global temperature versus impacts on human welfare. And so that's that's why even if they do think that, you know, oh, the government ought to do such and such, they're actually not qualified to say what the policy response should be. That's a more difficult question to answer. But then beyond that is a, there's a lot of these things where they they identify potential things that could happen, but the question is, well, how likely is it? And so for a lot of this stuff, it's you know p- activists would warn about these tr- these catastrophic scenarios, but when you'd go and look at the UN's own summaries of the published literature, and some of them like the the chance of this stuff happening by the year 2100 was that was quite small. Right. And so, again, you know, there's all sorts of things that could happen. You know, a meteor could hit. There's all sorts of things. And so the question is, are we going to revamp the entire global economy because of some thing that could happen 50 years from now when, uh, you know, there, there's other recommendations? And I, I guess maybe I'll just say one more thing, Michael, that it's a lot of times people hear this sort of talk and say, oh, so you're saying do nothing. No, there's plenty of groups right now, privately funded research teams looking at things like, OK, could we put you know, particles in the atmosphere that would reflect sunlight? Could we uh, sort of seed the ocean so that, you know, more algae grows that could absorb more CO2? Could we get different breeds of trees that absorb more CO2, right? So there's lots of things people are working on that would buy us more time in case it turned out 20 years from now. Oh, wait, things are worse than we thought. So again, it's, this is the way humanity would deal with the problem. And for people just to assume no, the answer is governments taking control of the energy and transportation sectors and drastically scaling back standards of living. It, to me, it's the the politics is driving that. Those are things that these people wanted to do anyway, and they're using climate change, you know, as sort of the justification of it. So it would seem that the solution is authoritarian taxation rather than scientific ingenuity. I think I think that's. If I was listening correctly, you're you're saying, look, there is, there there are a number of ways to try to um, get involved in the 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 problem and looking for a solution, and 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 there are there are some ways for you know actual science to be done in order to answer some scientific uh, inquiry versus no, this is the one solution that we have, and that is increased taxes on the energy industry and uh what what is happening with the carbon taxes like what is happening when you wholesale jump into that boat and what's really happening to individuals you know you've mentioned twice now that it's hard on families it's hard it's potentially incredibly harmful on humanity What's really going on when you see these uh, carbon taxes, when you see the, the government trying to take over and control the energy sector? Okay, yeah, sure. So let me just again reiterate the sta- this, you know, standard literature and stuff. It's the UN's own documents you know, from various editions of what's called the IPCC reports. If you go and look and say, okay, middle of the road scenario, if things play out 
the way, you know, business as usual is sometimes the phrase they use to say, you know, if governments don't really do much more in terms of policies, what's the likely outcome by the year 2100? And you say, what's the likely impact of climate change? And they'll quote it like as a percentage of GDP or something. And I'm saying, you know, it's, it's bad, but it's not catastrophic. And then when you compare that with, okay, if we aggressively implemented policies that would, you know, severely cut back on carbon dioxide emissions to try to contain that, what is the forfeited economic output from the fact that we're using more expensive energy and things like that? The number is comparable to the, you know, the ostensible threat from climate change, right? So it's, it's not a wash, but it's, they're in the same ballpark is what I'm saying. Again, it depends on the specifics and, you know, the, the, the numbers change slightly from addition to addition, but I'm speaking broadly here that it's not obvious that, you know, doing the one is the, you know, the necessary thing to do that all right thinking people would say, like they said, it's, it's, it's showing that it's a, it's a problem and the solution is very expensive. And so, you know, that, that's, and that's why, like I was saying earlier, William Nordhaus, for example, who wins the Nobel Prize for, this, for his work on this area, his own work suggests, yes, go ahead and government should tax carbon, but not too heavily. And it would still allow a lot of emissions such that by the year 2100, his model says the world you know, would be 3.5 degrees Celsius warmer relative to the pre-industrial baseline which for those who know these debates, that's way above what the activists say. It's not that they'd say, oh my gosh, that's runaway climate change. We're all dead if you allowed something that extreme. And yet Nordhaus, because again, what Nordhaus is doing, he's a good economist. I disagree with you know his faith in governments and whatnot, but he's just showing there's trade-offs involved. And so, so now to get back, so I think that's what you're asking me, like what, what's the problem? Why don't we just ramp up the, you know, the turn the dial and, and tax the heck out of carbon and, and use so-called clean energy? Well, look, there's a reason humanity right now, without government intervention, is relying so heavily on coal and oil and natural gas, um, you know, for for heating and transportation. It's because they're very convenient f- sources of energy. They're dispatchable, uh, especially for you know transportation. It's you know very dense form of energy, whereas to try to use solar or or wind, you know, those things are very intermittent or to try to use electric vehicles. There's lots of problems with that right now, just to completely try to switch over that the, you know, the batteries don't hold the charge. You don't have the charging stations set up and so forth. So there's lots of reasons right now that humanity relies so much on fossil fuels. And so if you just all of a sudden tried to force, you know, tried to wean them off of it in the matter of a couple of decades, there's a consequence, right? That we can't produce as much. We can't be transported as easily if we use, alternatives that we wouldn't have voluntarily chosen. Right. And so that, so that, I mean, that's the basic explanation. And so that's why putting a huge tax on carbon, for example, turns, you know, it, I mean, let's put it this way. The whole, the whole rationale of taxing carbon is to make carbon intensive energy sources more expensive so that businesses and households voluntarily use something else. Right. It's like to induce people to switch to electric or to induce people to get solar panels and whatever, because, oh, wow, my, my oil bill is huge now because there's this huge carbon tax built into it. Or when I fill up my, you know, try to fill up my SUV at the gas station, it's ridiculous because now built in, there's a $3 a gallon tax just because of the carbon tax, right? And so that's, that's the motivation. And so just like it causes pain when gasoline is expensive because of a war in, in you know, Ukraine, likewise, if the government's making gasoline more expensive because of a carbon tax, that pain is still similar in terms of, you know, how much now it's harder for households to avoid. And so you could say, oh, let's all get electric. But again, the, the, the reason we're, we're not all driving electric right now is that's more expensive or it's not as convenient. There's other problems with it. So, uh, that's, that's the, the, the gist of it. And so, it's not costless to, to force humanity to switch over and to use fossil fuels much less than they are right now. There is a cost of that. And, and so that's what, what I think people, and, I, and it's one thing for like advanced economies like the U S and Canada, we sort of have the luxury of switching to so-called clean energy and it wouldn't be as catastrophic. Whereas in the developing world, I mean, it's, that's serious. Like, like you would really be condemning those people to a substandard uh, level of, of consumption for decades uh, by, by putting these policies in place. So if someone's listening to you on, on one hand, it is, um, 
we have an actual problem with climate change going on and we need to look for solution or be, a, you know, try to be a part of a, a, the solution. Um, it's inconvenient or it's, it's, uh, it's an active push away from our natural habit. So when you were talking about the carbon tax being raised in order to push people off of using uh, fossil fuels, I was thinking of the way that they did that in Canada to wean people off of smoking. They just increased the tax so much uh, that a pack of cigarettes is just so expensive in order to encourage people to stop smoking. I think many people would go, yeah, yeah, Bob, that's, that's the point. Like that's exactly what, they're trying to do and it's good for mm -hmm. us so is there any is there any type of like measurable number or any any type of illustrations you could share with how catastrophic and difficult it would be like here in canada um we're a cold climate you know heating your house is a very serious thing um to have intermittent uh electricity to have to have things that are not as reliable as uh oil sitting in a tank beside your house that burns at uh, a hot rate as a certain btu level uh, that it's, it's pretty serious if we were to have intermittent heating in our homes can you try to help our listeners understand because on one hand you're seeing you're, you're sounding like a very reasonable uh, option and i i know that you're concerned and i'm 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 trying to maybe uh hear maybe more clearly what what would be the cost to people if we continue you know particularly in canada you know we're right now we're paying you know 50 dollars a ton for carbon output and that 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 that's affecting our situation already can you talk to that a bit Sure. So, yeah, and, and that's a good um, analogy for uh, you know, you know, the cigarette analogy. And and so I think the difference there is that it's it's true to the, just like force everybody to get to like get off cigarettes and whatnot. That people could say, yeah, it's for their own good, and isn't that what we're doing? But on the other hand, it's um, you know, it comes down to do you think that smoking cigarettes and you know and the the high that people get or were satisfying their craving from getting nicotine is that the same thing as a family enjoying heat in the winter you know, you know what i mean so right. or you, you know you could likewise you could say hey well let's let you know people don't need to eat meat meat or do people really need so many calories and you know you could do all sorts of things you could wean people off of electricity if you wanted to by making it expensive and and so again it's um th that's that's the sense in which you know th this thing impacts is that the basic stuff that people take for granted. And again, I, I would just stress to the listeners, just see how much it's, it's pinching the fact that gasoline's become more expensive in the last year and particularly like, you know, the last few months. And then, you know, to, to translate that and to say, okay, do you want it to be even permanently higher? And, and again, this stuff, you, you know, you can do uh, st standard math, you know, in terms of like just the direct translation. So in terms of the, the you know, the dollar $170 a ton, you know, that, that works out to a, a large um, increase in, in, I guess you guys have per liter uh, price in, in terms of gasoline. So there's, there, there is that element. And like you say, it's, it's not merely like some of it, it's hard to quantify because it's not, it's not the same thing. It's not just like, oh yeah, we, we would get heat, but it'd be more expensive. Like you were saying, Michael, if, if it's switching to um, solar or, or wind where where it's intermittent it could just be that it's just flat out not available for large periods of time and so maybe the way the utilities to handle that is they have you know brownouts or you know i don't know if you guys have that phrase up there but you know that that could be this thing and, and during periods of high demand it's just simply that oh it gets rationed you know and so your people have blankets on or, or they're sweating like crazy during the summer and so I, I, that sounds pretty Again, you mentioned that in the in you know in in North America, that in of itself would be awful and problematic, and and then you mentioned the developing world. Um, we're talking about potentially setting them back from being able to develop into a first world nation completely. Like, are are, are we talking about sending people back in uh, to poverty and 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 sending people back into? Um, uh, an incredibly low standard of living 
uh, when we're talking about the developing nations? Yeah, so I, I I believe that yeah the the long run just direct cost of this would be something like six, 60 cents a liter, um, just from from the carbon tax per alone, you know. And then again, if if the the problem too on top of all that stuff is is more is these more draconian measures get implemented, then people oil and gas companies stop developing, and so like the you know the supply gets restricted as well. So it's just even the quote you know fundamental baseline price is higher besides the, the tax that's slapped on top of it. So yes, to, to, to go back to what you were asking, it, it, it's bad enough what would happen in you know, more advanced economies, but in other places, you know, there's like, I, you probably heard things about, you know, with China, they're like unveiling coal-fired power plants I mean, weekly, depending on the time frame you're looking at. And, and that's because, you know, they're starting at a relatively low standard of living. They've had much more liberalization in recent decades. And so they're trying to catch up to the West and one of the ways you do that is through the use of, you know, cheap, affordable electricity. And so that's that's what you're going to be doing right now, having coal fired power plants. And so to it's sort of a two pronged thing. On the one hand, I think a lot of these governments, they actually aren't going to live up to what their pledges are um, as far as the Paris Climate Agreement. Or in some cases, you know, you can get into the specifics and look at this, but that what they agreed to do. It's, it's vis-a-vis the Paris climate agreement is basically what the baseline would have been anyway. You know what I mean? Like one of case they were saying, Oh, well emissions will increase and then eventually they'll peak and come down. And I was like, well, yes, that's like a tautology. <laughs> of course that's going to happen at some point. And you know, that's not requiring any, any sacrifice on your part. So I think that's, that's partly what's going on. A, a different way of looking at this stuff on this point is there's various websites that, um, I think one of them is climate tracker.org and it's, so it's a, a you know, a, a, a pro climate change or, or pro action on climate change website, right? This isn't some like, you know, right winger group. And they're looking at the Paris climate pledges and saying, even if all the governments followed their pledges, you know, the, the, we would blow away through the, the two degrees Celsius ceiling. And then they get even more refined and say, forget the pledges, look at what they've actually, what they're actually doing so far. And it's even worse. Okay, so just the mere fact that a bunch of governments have agreed, oh, yeah, we're going to do stuff that's, you know, the, the logic of it is we're going to do stuff that's very painful to our people, but it confers benefits on the rest of the world. And if we could all agree to do that, then we'd all be better off. That's sort of the logic of this, you know, these environmental climate change agreements that we're going to make energy more expensive for our people with policies pertaining to, to us. But then by reducing emissions, that kind of, you know, spills over in the rest of the world. And we just hope everybody else reciprocates. So even just because a bunch of governments right now agree to do that, we don't know that in 30 years they'll follow through with that. And so that, so that's what I'm saying is it's sort of the worst of both worlds where the Canadian government, for example, is going to impose punitive measures on Canadians and the world is still going to warm by more than two degrees Celsius anyway, because the rest of the you know world isn't going to follow through, particularly some of these you know developing countries that, you know, if they, if they don't even care that they're being accused of human rights violations, they're not going to care if somebody says, Hey, and you're not living up to your carbon dioxide pledge agreement. You know what I mean? Like that's just, that's ridiculous to assume that that's going to happen. So some of this stuff it's, you know, we can get here and, and, and look at the projections and I can say, Oh, you know, this guy's model says by the year 2100, by the one hand, that's kind of goofy that we're even doing that. That's, that's conceding too much to this whole premise, the, the fact that, or the, the, the idea they're going to do that. So that, you know, that's, that's one element of it. But then on the flip side, even if they were to go ahead and really clamp down and try to hit these targets, like I've said, it would be very draconian. Like it would, it would impose significant, I mean, it would be in, in some countries, it would mean mortality, right? That they, they, there would be people that would, that wouldn't live as long because they don't, they can't get reliable, affordable electricity and heating and so forth. Okay. I have so many questions out of, out of that segment, uh, that, to follow up with it. So let me try to get uh, them one at a time here. So first of all, what you're saying is from the, their own data, the current agreements do not fulfill the requirement to actually slow down their projections. So if, if everybody followed the current agreements, that we would still be dealing with a certain level of climate change that is unsatisfactory to climate watch organizations. Did I hear you correctly on that first point? 
Yes, you did. And let me see if I can. I'm, I'm pulling up the site right now. Let's see if it's. Okay, so my. What, you, you, while you pull up the site, let me ask you the question. Okay, I, I, yeah, I, here, here you go. I got it. Sorry. Um, so, right, yeah, so it, the, the website I, I like is it's called climateactiontracker.org. And they're saying right now the policies and actions that governments around the world have, uh, uh, you know, adopted by the year 2100 would allow for 2.7 degrees Celsius of warming. And, and again, the, the, what the UN is saying is that two degrees Celsius is the absolute maximum we could possibly allow. And let's try to keep it to 1.5 C. Okay. So this right. is, this is my follow-up question. So mm -hmm. I'm a Christian and I have long believed that God is in control. And I have also long believed that men are liars and men will put, you know, we love to create a cause and then to create an infrastructure of why we ought to be paid to be a part of the cause. It's, you know, for as long as I can remember. In fact, um, our group, the Liberty Coalition Canada, and a number of other freedom groups, we're, we're kind of in that phase right now where freedom has been really trampled on in Canada. And you have a lot of these fighters out there trying to promote freedom. And then everyone turns around and goes, well, wait a minute. Um, I lost my job over there because I was fighting for freedom over here. Um, now what do I do to feed my family? And so you have a cause and you create an entire administrative structure around that cause to build it up. So it just sounds insane to me for any human being to say, I've figured out how to model how to slow the warming of the earth. Like, so I don't know if that puts me in the world of climate change denier but I'd be much more susceptible to things like, yeah, we have a hundred year cycles of warming and cooling and we're in a warming cycle or, um, we, you know, the earth is rotating just a little bit closer to the sun and this, like, I would be much more interested or maybe just lend myself to thinking that this is somehow happening rather naturally that humans for all that we could pretend to care about would actually not be able to do anything about it. And I'm happy to be rebuked, Bob, but it really sounds, I have a hard time thinking that, you know, we, we look, at, look at the world health organization and what we've gone through with COVID. Like we have doctors running around pretending that masks, masking the entire world is going to stop the spread of viruses. And they know full well that that's not the case. So I, are any of these measures actually, can, can they prove that anything that we would do would be helpful? And certainly, could they even prove that their efforts went from the, the, the earth warming to 2.7 degrees warmer by 2100 to 2 degrees warmer? Okay, yeah. So, so. I appreciate that. I'm glad you brought that up. And, and I, I was trying to, I was alluding to that sort of hubris, you know, before when I was saying, you know, this is, we're just conceding the framework for the sake of argument that you're, you're right. And, and sometimes when I am talking to a, an audience on this stuff, like that's the first thing I will say is, Hey, what will the global temperature be in the year 2100? We have no idea. Right. Like it, it's on the one hand, it's absurd that we're sitting here arguing over that. And, and, it, and it, I'm not the first to use this analogy, but it, again, like look at it the other way around. Imagine people in the year 1920 pontificating about, you know, what what the world was going to look like in the year 2000. You know, they would have no idea, you know. And, and if, in fact, as you may have heard, one of the issues that was plaguing um, like like the city urban planners and such in the U.S. in the early 1900s was they were making, you know, projections of population growth and they were saying, we're going to be buried in horse manure, you know, if current trends continue. And so what are we going to do? And of course the automobile came along and that's what solved that problem. Right. And so I think likewise, my guess is in the year 2100, humans will look back sort of at the hysteria over climate change and be like, wow, they really, 
thought that carbon dioxide emissions, you know, even though the human contribution was a drop in the bucket and even though, you know, blah, 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 it's, it's not really in water vapor is actually a much more potent greenhouse gas than CO2. And, da, da, da. and I can't believe that, you know, this was a really big thing for humanity for 30 years back in the day. Like, isn't that funny? Look, so, so yes, that's what I think will happen. Now, having said that, does that mean this is all just, you know, complete hoax and it's just, you know, something that the intellectuals dreamt up in order to, uh, regulate everybody so i i do think that nefarious people with ulterior motives have used the climate change movement as a way to you know advance their agenda that they had wanted for other reasons but in terms of the actual science and whatnot so it's for sure you know co2 is a greenhouse gas and other things equal if humanity's activities allow for an increase in co2 in the atmosphere the world will be warmer than it otherwise would be. But that really by itself doesn't prove too much. For one thing, you know, some people are arguing, well, it's conceivable we would have been entering another ice age. And so maybe we do want, you know, there to be offsetting warming to try to, you know, stabilize things. Um, also, too, a, a big part of the the uncertainty in this area is the, the direct warming just from an increase in CO2 is not really the issue like that everybody agrees that wouldn't be catastrophic. You know, the stuff that's like just the basic chemistry in terms of if there's more CO2 in the atmosphere, then, you know, the heat gets retained, you know, the sunlight comes in, but then the infrared gets retained. It has to do with feedback mechanisms. And so it's like, Oh, as the world gets warmer, does that melt polar ice caps? And so then does this thing happen or so, you know, and it's, it's a lot of like, this does this or what happens with clouds? Like is, is if the world gets more moist and there's more clouds, do the clouds, is it that they reflect the sunlight or do they retain the heat more? You know, and it's not as obvious which way clouds even go. And that's one of the things they're having trouble modeling right now is, is the, you know, the, the cutting edge climate models of the world. They, they have a hard time knowing the role that clouds play, even though kind of intuitively we'd say, yeah, clouds are probably a big deal when it comes to, you know, sunlight coming in and so forth. So just things like that. It's the earth climate is an incredibly complex system and so, yeah, it's it's better than nothing. Like, you know, humans are gaining an understanding and the models they have today are better than the ones they had 30 years ago. But they still there's a lot they don't know. And the last thing I'll say on that, Michael, is I once a few years ago just did a, a sort of review and I looked at it was a guy who worked for NASA and he had a, a website that was like ostensibly debunking the, the critics, you know, or the deniers. And so, and he was trying to show that, no, this is hard hitting science and don't listen to the, you know, Rush Limbaugh and Sean Hannity. Like this is real stuff. And so he was trying to show how the latest suite of climate models had performed. And, you know, they make projections about what the, you know, the, the range of climate of what te global temperatures will be with a 95% confidence interval. Did it. And the, the, the projections were much higher than the reality. And in fact, it was flirting with the actual observations, you know, the, the real world temperatures relative to the projections of these models were almost outside the 95% confidence interval, you know, meaning we could confidently reject the model and saying, no, it is wrong. Like even very vari variation, you know, natural variability cannot account for the fact that this model was way, way off. So that's what I'm saying that the people who are talking about, oh, this is hard hitting science or like even using their own metrics and whatever it's, a lot of, you know, some of the most cutting edge models were on the verge the last I checked a few years ago of us being able to confidently reject the hypothesis that these models were accurately modeling global temperature. And they were they were wrong in the direction of alarmism. They were saying it was going to be hotter than it actually was. OK, so my second question comes from your second point about uh, countries not actually following uh, their promises. So. I have a hard one on this one because I'm a conservative in Canada who loves all of the oil that we produce. I love what it gives to our economy. I love that I can be warm. I like to go out and chop wood and burn that. Um, so on one hand, I like to sit here and go, well, look, if Canada did nothing, it would mean nothing because China's not going to do anything and India's not going to do anything. So why would we, as you said earlier, why would we harm our own citizens in order to contribute nothing? 
Um, and then on the other hand, it's that idea of leading by example. And I find myself going back and forward with, well, if we lead by example, that will be helpful. But just as you think about politics and you think about politicians and you, and you just think about human greed and you think about human desires for power, it really does seem all of the accords are just a smokescreen, like, or just a flat out blatant fraudulent event, like lavish meetings, everybody talking about issues that they can't nail down, walking away, penalizing their citizens, except for anybody who just wants to get ahead economically, they're going to do what they want and still pretend that the left will come out of it pretending like we're all unified. So can you walk me through that, all that tension, uh, that, that I'm personally feeling on that issue? You know, um, I want Canada to walk away from all of these things immediately and just, you know, like let, let's just live free. Um, I would, I would hope similarly uh, for the United States, uh, especially when we have so many nefarious operators, H how do you navigate that personally? Okay. Yeah, sure. Great question. So, uh, just a few points maybe to warm up so again it's it's sort of a two-pronged thing where like i, I can try to cr criticize what the canadian government is doing even on its own terms and then sort of step back and say okay but their framework is flawed anyway so even if you were going to use a carbon tax you know as, as in your toolbox of how do we deal with climate change and how can canada be a leader on this issue what they're doing makes no sense that again they're setting the number the level to get up to $170 per ton, that's way out of line for what reasonable estimates of, of what the actual social cost of, of carbon dioxide emissions is, even if you stipulate that whole framework. Um, so there's that element. Also, too, they have things like the clean fuel standard, right? So textbook, you know, the, the way a mainstream economist would make the case for a carbon tax is he would say, oh, the beauty of a carbon tax is it's decentralized, right? It's a, it's a market solution, you're just augmenting what the price signals are so that businesses and households can, you know, internalize the true social cost of, of emissions and then they can make the choice they want. Right. You would like, in other words, the government's not telling you you can't buy a gas guzzling SUV. They're just saying, keep in mind now, gasoline is going to be such and such more expensive because we have this carbon tax. So now re rerun your calculations. Probably a lot of you are going to buy an EV now because of that or businesses will be more likely to install insulation once their heating bill is a lot higher because of the carbon tax, you know, that kind of thing. But you don't, so if you're going to go down that route, you don't then also need the government to do a clean fuel standard and to, and to dictate the particulars and micromanage the energy sector or to have, you know, just outright bans on the development of um, oil sands and things like that. But yet that's what the activists want. So they're like, oh yeah, give us, go ahead, let's tax the heck out of carbon. But we also want to have bans on, what they call tar sands development. And we want to just have mandates that such and such percent of electricity production needs to be by renewable sources by this year. And I'm saying so that none of that makes any sense. If you're doing a carbon tax, that's supposed to get rid of all these top down government mandates. And so that, again, it just shows they're not even you know doing what the textbooks recommend. Um, now if for your point, and I, I have seen this too, that, you know, like guys like me will say, wait a minute, you know, like Donald Trump was good to pull out of the Paris Agreement because the U.S., you know, is doing all this sacrifice and India and China aren't and why, you know, we're just suckers here and this is a global problem. And so sometimes people will say, well, you know, that's being very selfish and, and short-sighted. For example, you know, w w would you, if you were at a park, you don't just, th you know, throw litter on the ground and say, well, why should I throw my candy wrapper in the garbage? Because what if that guy over there doesn't? You know, in other words, like, yeah, like you're saying, like exhibiting leadership where people will say the governments around the world, if the U.S. and Canada and, and Germany don't adopt strict emission limits, then, of course, China and India aren't going to like there's no way, you know, it can't be that we sit back and wait for the developing world to do it first and then we'll follow suit. And so, and so they make arguments like that. And so I guess the. Uh, the issue is that, yeah, exercising leadership is good if the plan made sense, 
Right. But it wouldn't make sense if you're on a sinking ship to say, I'm going to exercise leadership and I'm going to like take my coffee mug and start bailing the water out over the edge. If we're sinking rapidly, like, no, you got to get to the lifeboats or what, you know, whatever to make that analogy work in terms of what a better strategy would be. So exercising leadership for something that doesn't make any sense is not a good idea either. And so I'm saying it is unbelievably naive to think, oh, governments around the world are going to stick to these emission limits for the next hundred years. And that's the way we're going to tackle climate change. That's just, that's not going to happen. That's unrealistic. And so we shouldn't fool ourselves. And, and, and the ironic thing too is it's wasting valuable time. So partly I'm not as concerned because it's true. I don't think this is actually a threat to the existence of humanity. But the thing is, even if I did, I wouldn't trust, you know, governments around the world to en- enact taxes on carbon to help mitigate it. So if, to give an example, of what I mean, Michael, let's suppose it really were the case that humanity needed to drastically reduce carbon dioxide emissions in the next 20 years, or our grandchildren are all underwater what we would do then is massively increase like nuclear power plants and you know proliferation of them because we would know that that would be the way to get um you know to, to not sacrifice our standard of living as much and and yet to be able to drastically reduce carbon dioxide emissions and yet the extreme environmental activists not only do they want to tax you know fossil fuels out of existence they also oppose nuclear by and large and so to me, that just reveals they don't actually believe their own rhetoric. It's more that they don't like capitalism. They don't like excessive energy use. It's not so much that the climate change issue directly is the one that's bothering them. So if I'm hearing you right, and and um, I just want to thank you, Bob, for taking the time. And I know sometimes I ask questions that I know I, re- I repeat questions, but if what you're saying is twofold. Again, you, you've been saying that the plan itself, whether it's taxation or it is forced to these uh, renewable energies, you're saying that the models, if we do everything and if we do nothing, the models still come out fairly comparable to one another. And, and then all of the pain of forcing citizens to do these things is really harmful to humanity. So you're, am I right in like, I know I've asked this before, but I just, you're basically saying the plan's not good. And then the virtue signaling around the plan isn't any good either, or the plan's not good. And then the policies around the plan are so harmful to people. Am I, I just want to make sure I'm hearing, I don't want to misrepresent you, but that's what I think I'm hearing. I think that's right. And so let me just put it in my words that, yes, the the policies that are being advanced right now don't make sense, even if the underlying threat of climate change is exactly what the activists say it is. Right. That there would be much there would be different. Like if I, you know, if, if, if I were in charge advising governments and I believe that we really needed to drastically reduce carbon dioxide, I mean, the way they're trying to go about it, it is much more harmful to humanity than it needs to be. But then beyond that, yes, the what they're saying the goals should be also don't make sense given what the actual literature says as far as, you know, here's the issues of climate change and so on. So there's that element uh, as well. And, and the other, the, uh, the irony here too is by all this focus on th- policies that won't actually do much for the ostensible problem, it's distracting away from p- potential solutions that would work. So to give an example, um, there was, it was, uh, the book was Freakonomics. So it was the economist was Stephen Levitt. And then Stephen Dubner was like the journalist, I think, who helped him write it. So they had this best-selling book, Freakonomics, that came out. And then they had like Freakonomics 2 or something, the sequel. I forget what the title was. And in the, in the sequel, they dealt with climate change. And they went around and talked to a bunch of these groups that were working on sort of out of the box ideas for, you know, how, what could we do if it turned out that there's a problem? And it was like for a few hundred million dollars, because what they had, like one group, for example, when Mount Pinatubo erupted, global temperatures dropped because like the air around the world, you know, was covered with the soot from the volcanic eruption and that reflected sunlight. And there was a measurable drop until, you know, that stuff got washed out of the atmosphere. And so this group was just studying and saying, okay, well, if we had to, could we like, put up a bunch of balloons and like pumps sulfur dioxide in the air to reflect sunlight or something. And, you know, they're starting this and they were coming up with, yeah, for like a hundred million dollars, we could 
sort of do this stuff. So again, not that you'd want to do that necessarily, but the point is there's all sorts of things they could do. Or again, they could like put in iron and, and certain things and like get phytoplankton in the, in the oceans to grow more so that they would absorb more CO2. There's all sorts of things. There's groups right now working on like you just having actual big jets to just run, you know, the air through the, these tunnels and just directly sucks uh, carbon right out of the air. You know, and right now it's it's too expensive. You know, like technologically it works. It's just it's way too expensive to do it that way. But, you know, as they keep working on it, maybe they bring the cost down. So there's if, if the issue is there's, you know, the, the Earth's atmosphere is retaining too much heat. There's all sorts of ways humanity could deal with that besides governments around the world, you know, taking over the energy and transportation sectors and getting people to cut back on carbon dioxide emission. An analogy I use, Michael, is if the issue is like, oh, gee, after each movie, there's a bunch of popcorn on the floor of the theater. You know, we could get real draconian and just, you know, have a real strict tax at the door and say anybody who gets caught bringing popcorn in, you know, we're going to fine you $30 and strip search everybody. Or you could just hire people to go in after the movie and sweep up the popcorn. You know what I mean? So like, it's not obvious why if the issue is around the world, too much CO2 is being emitted, that the only solution has to be, we need a global surveillance network to stop it at the source everywhere, as opposed to maybe there's a way we could suck it out of the atmosphere, you know? So again, I'm just, there's people working on this stuff, but my point is the left-wing activist groups, you think they would be applauding that stuff, but no, they just went ape when that Freakonomics sequel came out because they were saying, oh, by focusing on these technological solutions, you're, you're, you know, you're taking the wind out of the sails of what we know the solution has to be, which is you know, to drastically cut back on emissions and to switch over to renewables. And so they just demonized these scientists. They, just, you know, they went after the publisher saying you're spreading disinformation. So again, it, it makes me think they don't actually believe their rhetoric because they really thought humanity's existence were at stake you think they would be happy that, oh, look it, there's this solution over here that's only going to cost $500 million, as opposed to our solution, which has an implicit cost of trillions of dollars. Bob, I really appreciated both of those analogies. Uh, the popcorn one was a great one. I, I hope people get to take that and because it's so true. You, you, you think of the one way until you just are presented with the other. You know, If you don't want popcorn on the floor, of course you make sure that people don't eat popcorn. Or you just pay a few people to sweep it up. Like that, that's a great analogy. The, the analogy of the sinking ship and the, and the leadership, I, I kind of want to dig into this just because we're talking a little bit about leftism. So this is the reason I, I, I appreciated that analogy because it's also like you're on a sinking ship and you've decided to go grab a teacup to start bailing out the ocean liner while you have a bunch of guys at the other end of the ship saying go use the teacup. You're doing a great job who are literally like pumping water into the ship. Right. And laughing at you because they know you're going to get tired. They know that you're going to your, your, your virtue and your strength are all going to fail. And once you've passed out, they'll let you fall off board. Maybe they'll take their big hose out then and put it and turn around, just, just reverse the pump. Maybe at that point they go, Hey, you know what? Uh, uh, we, we've, we've gained a better position. So now we'll, we'll deal with this. But that's the way it feels when you're talking about the left and their policies and then how connected this is with, you know, falling in line with, with the, with the Chinese government that, seems to be a fairly aggressive operator against the West. It, it, right, yeah, to, I guess, make that analogy more in line with what I think is going on, and I think I'm, you and I agree on this, it would be as if the, the ship actually isn't sinking, but yet the one guy thinks it isn't, he's bailing out, and then later they're going to have an arm wrestling contest, and so the guys at the end of the ship are just watching you bail out the ship like, because they know, yeah, go ahead and, and keep doing that because now when we have our contest in a little bit, we're going to be having advantage. I I like to dig down on analogies. So it's like, they're all sitting in the hot tub enjoying martinis while they're telling you, Oh, look, that hole in the ship is full of water, but it's just the pool. Right. And then you're, you're throwing it out as like, not as fast as the filtration system could. 
and then they're going to go back and have arm wrestles uh, after they've had you know days and days of rest, and you've been trying to empty the pool. Right, right. And so, uh, yeah, I'm sure your listeners understand where we're going with this, but but right, I. I, again, so this, I'm not impugning like the actual scientists, you know, who are working on this stuff, but in terms of the funding and like, why would certain groups care about that? Let me just give one other example. So I've already mentioned the fact that you would think climate activists who really care about this issue would be big supporters of nuclear. And yet they're typically not. Another example I've seen is with um, mandates for so-called renewable energy, like in the U.S., it's a state by state thing, state renewable portfolio standards and things like that. And in states where that are dry, hydropower is considered renewable, right? Like, why wouldn't it be? You know, the water, there's a water cycle and yeah, sure. But in states where there actually is, where hydro is a viable thing there, that doesn't count as a, as a renewable source, right? It's got to be wind or solar. And so that's, that's what I mean, where it's, it always lines up with like, if something actually made sense and was practical in like, then they don't like it. it it's got to be something that's completely impractical. And that's the, you know, the favored uh, energy source or technology or, or whatnot. And so that, again, it, it makes me think it's not so much that they really want a region to get its energy or electricity from renewable sources. It's, they don't like the status quo. They think humanity or capitalism is, you know, has too much consumption energy use. And so let's make this as painful. It, it's, it's, you know, people have compared it to a, in a religion and yeah, there's got you people, you know, humanity has been sinful. It's, it's hurt the planet and it needs to suffer a penance in order to make up for it. So if there's a technological fix, and that's also why those technological fixes infuriate them. No, it can't just be that we put some mirrors in space and reflect some of the sunlight for 30 years while, you know, humanity sort of gradually adopts more electric vehicles and whatever and reduces CO2 emissions spontaneously or voluntarily and then we take the no that that's too easy like there there needs to be pain to acknowledge the fact that we have been bad boys and girls like that's kind of the mentality um and and so so yes given that i think there's a lot of left wing groups that their ultimate goal is they don't like a strong united states for various reasons they and and so yes they see that these climate policies their natural in, uh consequence would be to slow economic growth in the you know western nations u.s in particular and and that's that's why they actually favor them can you go back for our listeners and just explain again what you meant about re the, the definition of renewable energy changing from one region to another oh sh sure so i i had noted so i don't know this is still true this was true 10 years ago when i was like looking at these issues on this matter but so in the united states um some of the regulations in the name of climate change were done at the state level and they would have um, renewable uh, portfolio standards or RPSs and they would have mandates saying things like, oh, in our state, such and such percent of electricity production has to come from renewable sources by this target year. You know, and various states would adopt, you know, and like the real liberal states would have more aggressive targets and, and such. And so what I noticed is that what counted as so clearly wind and solar power are, are renewable sources, but in some regions, hydropower, you know, to be able to generate electricity from the flow of water, that was considered renewable. You know, and that kind of makes sense. That, yeah, that, you know, in terms of what's just going to constantly be renewing naturally. Yeah, water, if you can generate electricity from water, that's kind of like wind power, right? But in certain regions... Uh, like in the Northeast, for example, where, you know, the near Niagara Falls and whatever, where hydro actually was a major component already in the electricity mix. In those states, the activists didn't push, you know, say, oh, you know what? You guys are already good. You already generate such and such percent of your electricity from hydro. So we're not going to bother, you know, lobbying your government, you know, your state legislature. No, there they would impose renewable portfolio standards where hydro didn't count as a renewable because otherwise they already would have satisfied it and then there'd be no, no change. And so there they wanted to make electricity more expensive by, by forcing artificially reliance on wind or solar. Yeah. I've always, I've always wondered why Canada is remotely in this conversation when we draw so much of our energy and sell our energy to the United States uh, that is significantly uh, from hydro production. <laughs> yeah. We, <laughs> We we got 
like you just mentioned Niagara Falls, I was sitting there thinking about, yeah, I think I know a place right near where I live where there's a lot of renewable energy that keeps kind of just falling every single year. Um, so, Bob, where do we go from here? Um, what are some of your thoughts about where we, you know, you and I are both trying to navigate this. You're, you're, you're trying to not be a climate change denier. You're, you're trying to have some scientific solutions for scientific problems, trying to, uh, you know, mitigate the, you know, political opportunism that goes on. Um, certainly on the left right now that kind of leads toward this, you know, this nationalistic bent. Um, if Canada were to meet some of its targets, I'm concerned that like Canadians aren't going to be able to heat their homes. Like you said, there's a potential for brownout situations where, Hey, turn your heat on for four days, but it's off for a day here. Um, where do we go from here? What are, what are your thinking? Um, it, it's it's difficult because things have become so polarized. So I'm in the United States, and here, you know, things are extremely polarized. Uh, that there's grounds for optimism and pessimism, I suppose. On the one hand, because like you you alluded to the COVID um, re regime, and so there, I think people did see that. Oh yes, you know, there there really is an issue. You know, there was this virus that was ripping through, and certain uh, portions of the population were very vulnerable, especially with the earlier strains. But the policies that were adopted did not make sense, you know, even given what the ostensible threat was. And then now, like for a lot of the stuff that is clearly, you know, just in, in place to save face or because there's other things going on. Um, and so I think the public is more receptive if I'm telling them, oh, there's a similar thing going on with climate change because they've seen it with their own eyes and, you know, and that. Um, also, the fact that, you know, the, the spike in in natural gas, I mean, in, in Europe, there's a full-blown energy crisis and, it's, and it predated you know, Russia's invasion of Ukraine, the natural gas prices were like a factor of five higher in Europe from a year earlier. And so there, they I mean, they really are having an energy crisis. And so I think people can, can see that. And then just even seeing the, you know, the price at the pump right now in terms of gasoline prices and just more generally price inflation, how hot that's been recently. You know, I, th I think citizens realize, oh, this is this is real. Like when these people are saying these policies are going to make gasoline more electricity more expensive. I have a taste of what that feels like this. You know, this isn't just some academic thing that that's real. And so that might help with the resistance to it. But then again, on the other hand, th th these policies are so draconian and a large part of the public goes along with them. So it's it's hard to know how that plays off. I mean, in the United States, I think ultimately what's going to happen is you're going to see either de facto or de jure, you know, separation that, you know, different jurists, whether it's Florida or Texas or something like becoming largely independent from the rest of the country and just hit people splitting up into their own different groups because the, 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 the citizenry is so divided on these issues. Like I, I don't see how that's going to be reconciled anytime soon. It's interesting. I, I've been saying that I, I think that there will, I agree with you, I think in the United States there will be that division. You'll find more liberty-minded people migrate to, you know, uh, free states and you're, and you're, you're going to see more socialists want to migrate to more socialist states. I think here in Canada, what we're going to see is just, well, I think we're already gone. I don't think there's going to be any migration from one province to another in, in the sense of any type of measurable difference because our federal government has so much control. Um, how does an individual navigate the difference between the difference between the outright denying the problem or denying that there's an issue and talking about the economic reality of the, the crazy overreaction. So to back to the metaphor, the, the, the tanks, the tanker's not sinking. We're madly, you know, taking water out in a teacup. Um, some people are going to say, well, look, there's a leak, like at least there's a leak and, and we should be thinking about that. How, how do you, how do you, na how do you navigate that and speak specifically about that to help people? I don't want to use the word balanced because it's so overused, but 
to have maybe a, a real informed perspective or where were the sources you'd send them to? And then I have a final question that doesn't have anything to do with uh, climate. It has to do with the, uh, with the schools of economics that you mentioned at the beginning. Sure. Um, let's see. Uh, I, I, I guess uh, the, the group that I, I so I don't work for them anymore, but I, I would send them to, um, they focus mostly on U.S., policies but the the institute for energy research um you know in their websites institute for energy research.org uh for canadians i do a lot of work for the fraser institute and they have real balanced you know it's it's not ideological it's you know very empirical driven stuff just you know showing like things like with like wildfires for example you know recently it was a big thing and, and i did a study for them a couple of years ago just showing you know the government's own numbers in terms of the acreage burned and things and it's no, it's it's not, you know what I mean. So there's lots of things like that where something gets takes hold in the media, and you just go look at the numbers, and they're not there. So again, the Fraser Institute is really good about just showing that what the actual numbers are, and to try to contain the hysteria, um, to say, hey, what were these promulgated solutions? Will they actually help? Because because that's the thing, a lot of this stuff, it's like, hey, there's this problem, let's do something, and then. It might be annoying if, if somebody's coming along and saying, well, that solution isn't actually going to help. And people say, oh, you know, you're always so pessimistic. And, and but like I say, with the climate change issue, for, for one thing, you are helping if you're pointing out that that's not going to do anything. Um, but also, yeah, uh, I would tell people if they're, if they're curious to go read that that Freakonomics book. Again, I can't think of the exact title, but it's the it's the sequel to it. I think it's like Super Freakonomics or something corny. But again, he's going and interviewing various scientists. You know, these aren't fringe people and, and talking about their uh, different ideas. So just to show it's not that we're saying, oh, hey, this probably isn't going to be a big deal. Let's not worry about it and cross our fingers. That's not what we're saying. We're saying, no, there's lots of research going on for various things that could be done. Um, I suppose, you know, if, if people want there to be government policies, you could do things like giving tax credits for research on electric vehicles and things like that. You know, I mean, I would be much more open to that as opposed to, you know, imposing taxes on things we don't like, you know, rather like say, hey, we'll reduce your tax bill if you do things that could possibly help. It's just a very, very small lesson on incentivization, right? That is one of the major differences between a capitalist perspective and a socialist perspective. The socialist perspective or the collectivist perspective is tax you give us the money for us to find the solution and to maintain power until we find the solution. And where the capitalist perspective is, is we give you tax breaks to incentivize you to come up with a solution, which then you are able to market and sell and create more wealth. And we remain a limited government. Would, would, would I be explaining that correctly, Bob? Oh yeah, I, I think that's that's perfectly correct. That that right, the classical liberal limited government is supposed to just you know maintain the rules and then allow people to do their own thing. And yeah, if there's a problem, just foster an environment where decentralized individuals can you know if somebody hits on the solution, then everybody else can adopt it quickly, as opposed to the government saying this is what the solution is going to look like. And here, whether we're it works or not, make it happen. Right, right. Yeah. Okay. Okay. My last question is uh, out of le out in left field. So you mentioned the different schools of economics, and um, um, you you mentioned the one school. I think it was the Austrian school that that proposed economic cycles. So I just got finished reading uh, principles for dealing with the changing world order: why nations succeed and fall, and it's a, a book by Ray Dalio, and. He would say that we are at the end of a major economic cycle um, in, in the West, that we'd be in stage five, which is like decadence and debt being, you know, just, just debt being um, fa manufactured beyond what we can handle because nobody wants to live um, without the comfort that we've built up. And that will absolutely, within the next 10 or 15 years, lead to a major economic decline. So it'll, we're in stage five, and, and stage six is literally like a, a, a change of the regime order. It's uh, usually the, the change of um, the reserve currency. Uh, it, it involves war, uh, potentially uh, soft war, like a cold war. 
uh, until resolution or right into a hot war. Um, what would be your perspective on where we are at or, or whether or not uh, that perspective is at all correct or, or helpful? Okay, sure. So just to uh, set the context or clarify. So yeah, what I was saying earlier that the Austrian school, you know, Ludwig von Mises had de- in particular had developed this theory of the business cycle and, and Friedrich Hayek elaborated on it. And that's what, how Hayek won, what he won the Nobel Prize for. Um, where just the standard, you know, the boom bust cycle, like we have, re- you know, these periods of apparent prosperity and then there's recessions, you know, so the unemployment rates real low for a while and then it spikes back up in these wild ups and downs in the market economy. Where does that come from? You know, some people think it's inherent to capitalism. Some people think, oh, yeah, that's just the price of innovation. That's what you, you know, to, to get the benefits of capitalism, you got to be able to suffer these, you know, downside. And Mises said, no, that it has to do with the banking system and artificially expanding and contracting credit and interest rates, you know, get up, pushed artificially low and then spike. And that's what causes these periods of false prosperity that are then followed by the inevitable bust. So that's just the regular business cycle. But so now for Dalio's work, so I'm not I haven't read his stuff. I've, I've seen people, you know, secondhand summaries of it. So his, his thesis, you know, or his diagnosis could be consistent with the Austrians. But it's, it sounds like they're talking about different things. Like he's talking about broader cycles, not just, you know, oh, a recession in the early 80s and then, in you know, in 2008 and so forth. Um, so, yeah, I, I do think that the, the, we're at the, on the cusp of the collapse of the U.S. empire. That I, that I think that, yeah, that the, U, the dollar is not going to be the world's reserve currency 30 years from now. But probably even shorter, but I'll just give myself 30 just to be, you know, in my mind, absolutely safe. Um, and... Then that, yeah, I think that China is going to be, I, I don't know that it's going to be like the, the dominant superpower. Maybe it'll be more of a regional thing, or maybe there'll be a period where it'll be regional. But I don't think 30 years from now, the U.S. will be considered the global superpower by any stretch. So the one thing that um, I took from the book, it was really interesting, was how how our worldviews shape the transition or, or, or shape the decline where, where he, he said he, he came from an evolutionary standpoint, which I I don't, I don't particularly appreciate. So he talked very neutrally about, you know, uh, we've got these, you know, we've got, we've got these cycles and, 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 and then the, uh, the, the capacity building and in the innovative building and in the production site phase, that's that, you know, that's amazing. They went into the decadent debt phase and, you know, he didn't mention things like greed and he didn't mention, you know, things like, um, immorality, but, but he, he did sprinkle it in there once in a while where he'd talk about, you know, the, the worldview of a nation, um, the strength of the church or the strength of, uh, a deep culture can help the transition be peaceful or can help the, you know, elongate the, the, the phase uh, what would you be advising to individuals as they're trying to navigate that type of, of change in, in, in the culture? Like, especially if, you know, basically it seems like it's coming regardless because of our past behavior, what can individuals do in the future to mitigate that transition, I guess? Well, for, you know, first just to document that, yes, I, I think what we're seeing is is nuts that in terms of government policies and central banks that, yeah, the expansion of the Fed's balance sheet has just been astronomical, especially since COVID. Uh, the huge increase in the U.S. federal government's debt uh, just, just skyrocketing as a, as a share of GDP, for example, just in a few short years. Um, completely irresponsible. And then just culturally that, you know, here in the United States, we're arguing that the Supreme Court nominee, you know, is being challenged to define a woman. And, you know, we all know that the coin is like she knows what a woman is. And, you know, we all know what's going on there. But just that that's where we are. Or one of the controversies is I don't know how much is percolated, but the, the company Cracker Jack, you know, that that's the butter and or, um, popcorn and caramel and, and, and peanuts and whatnot. They're, they have a, a campaign out where they're called Cracker Jill and they're featuring female athletes. And so some of the conservatives like Ben Shapiro are all mad about that. But my wife and I were watching, I was saying, but at least they're acknowledging what 
because they're female athletes. You know what I mean? Those are actual women, you know, so that's a, that's a plus. And I'm saying, and, and the, the singer is good. It's not like mumble rap, you know, that, hey, you know, I'm, I'm not, you know, I'll take wins when I can get them. So, I mean, that's kind of where we are, where it's like, hey, do you think that men and women are distinct categories? And like, okay, then we basically can have a conversation. And so from a Christian perspective that, yeah, this is what it looks like when the world is just insane. And, you know, people drawing parallels to the Roman Empire and its decadence and, you know, pornography and things. And, and that's, as you know, so, yes, I I think that this really is just this, this there's signs here of a collapsing empire, a society that's, I think, in store for a reckoning. And, I, I, you know, I'm focused on the United States because that's where I live, obviously. But I, I think it's for the West in general, a lot of these chickens are coming home to roost. Um no, it's interesting. You're focused on the United States, but mm-hmm. I've been saying to Americans all all along, you know, when the States falls, you know, so many other places fall. I, I, I truly believe that Canadians have a, they have a little brother syndrome where they don't like to pay mm-hmm. compliments to Americans, but it's just, it's just garbage. We have our, we have so much of what we have because of the free nation of the United States. Um, I think that as America falls, you'll just see, you know, Canada be a, be a colony of China uh, uh, as long as uh, as long as the Americans would allow that. I just can continue to see our our prime minister to be infatuated with China and uh, Chinese policy. So, um, yeah, and I'll just say on that, like people are saying, oh, so what you think like Chinese worship? They don't need to literally invade or or the way it could play out. It, again, I'm not saying this is a formal prediction, but yeah. this kind of thing wouldn't surprise me. Is that yes? This is the Chinese. I mean, they have a much higher savings rate than the United States does, and they just keep acquiring ownership of stuff as we keep running trade deficits. And then, as the U.S. you know has calamities and there's martial law on the streets or whatever, and you could see the dollar crashes and Washington's broke, and then they turn to the U.N. and ask for help, like peacekeeping troops to come in. And that could be because the politicians in charge are actually you know bought and paid for by the Chinese government, and then a lot of the peacekeeping troops are Chinese. You know what I mean? I'm, again, I'm just throwing out scenarios, but it, it wouldn't have to be that uh, aircraft carriers from China line up outside our coast. And then it's a formal invasion. Like again, it's, it's this insidious thing where they kind of just can sit back and just watch us implode because of our own stupid policies. Well, and, and, and the thing about it that, that um, Dalio talks about is that it's just, we've seen this in the past. We, we've seen it in the past when, um, the Dutch Gilder uh, no longer was the um, the reserve currency when there was a transition from the British pound uh, to the American dollar. The, the, it's just um, he again explains it neutrally when you know I don't think anyone's a neutral player, but um, it seems that we have a lack of a, an imagination for what is possible, especially when we have when we're running so far into these terrible economic policies that are combined with this vision of, uh, you know, climate change uh, apocalypse. Right. So again, I haven't read his stuff directly. I've just seen secondhand summaries of it, but it, it seems like it checks out and you're right. Like I was recently at a financial conference where the people were all, sympathetic like you know i got up and gave my powerpoint and i'm showing some of these trends and they're all you know they were alarmed but you know they didn't think i was a nut job or something and yep yep you nailed it dr Mer-. but then talking to people after and i was mentioning how yeah i didn't think the dollar was going to be the world's reserve currency uh i may have said within 10 years of the you know to this guy privately and, and he was looking at me like i was nuts you know and he was just saying well where else would people invest you, you know you got to go invest in new york or you, you know i mean like he, they i think you're right it, it's it's just for some people it's it's hard and this guy would i think was canadian the one i was talking to you know i mean it wasn't even that he was just like oh my my country you know what i mean it was just yeah <laughs> so, so but the thing like i say he did know it was just like to me what was the obvious implication just refused to see it like no something it can't be that bad something will intervene and you know i imagine like yeah like the people in the british empire in 1913 probably had no idea what was coming. And so, yeah. Yeah. Well, Bob, this has been very helpful. Thank you for coming on and discussing these important things. Uh, I I'm really, uh, yeah, I'm, I am truly the generalist. So, uh, if any of my questions, uh, 
didn't get into an area where where we need to go deeper uh, for other people to understand. Uh, I'd love to have you back on. And if there's an area where you want to dive really deep in or even bring a PowerPoint presentation to some uh, some exact point on, you know, economies that you want to talk about. I'd love that in the future. So, you know, thank you for coming on. And I just love learning about these different areas and and how they're all right now converging on this uh, obstruction of our liberty and also, a, you know, a major change of our worldviews. And, and we're, we're trying to navigate that in, in an informed way so that we're not duped by it. So I just want to thank you for coming on and sharing some of the information that you're bringing forward. Well, thanks for having me, Michael. And uh, yeah, I appreciate the format and, and your attitude of like, let's let's tell people the, the truth and not pull punches, but also to be responsible. And so, yeah, th- this was this was a great conversation. 